of just 64 squares. I can control it, dominate it. I've been watching your games. You're the best player here. You've got your gift, and you've got what it costs. That was all you had, and you was all I had. Isn't it intimidating to be a girl among all those men? I'm not afraid. Hello and welcome to Between the Lines. This is a discussion of 2021 Emmy nominees for Outstanding Writing for a Limited Series presented by the WGA West, the Writers Guild Foundation, and Variety. Uh, for this session, we're going to take a deep educational dive into the pandemic water cooler with Mayor of Easttown and WandaVision. And uh, with these wonderful writers, we'll talk about limited series more generally, then we'll explore scene pages from their nominated scripts. Uh, it's going to be fun. I'm thrilled to be here. I hope you all are too. And for those of you who don't know me, I am Lauren O'Connor, and I'm a librarian in the Writers Guild Foundation Library. Uh, and I just want to take an opportunity to say, while I have this spotlight, um, if you're into this sort of thing, script pages on screen with commentary, um, you will love the new series I host with my colleague Javier Barrios called WGF Library Script Breakdown, where we sit down on Zoom with a writer and we break down a script they wrote in full. Um, and we have some really exciting guests and breakdowns coming up. So stay tuned about that. If you're not subscribed to the Writers Guild Foundation newsletter, you can get subscribed at wgfoundation.org. Um, so first to get started, we're gonna take a look at um, some clips from some of the nominees. Um, then what's gonna happen, I'll introduce, introduce you to everybody on the panel. Um, then we'll talk for a little bit about limited series. Um, and then we'll just dive in and break down scenes um, with pages on screen. And if there's a little bit of time, we'll take some audience questions. Um, so if that sounds good, uh, we can go ahead and roll those clips. Wanda, hmm. is there something special about today? Well, I know the apron is a bit much, dear, but I am doing my best to blend in. No, no, there on the calendar, someone's drawn a little heart right above today's date. Oh, yes, the heart. Hmm. Well, don't tell me you have forgotten, Viz. Forgotten? Oh, wonder. I'm incapable of forgetfulness. I remember everything. That's not an exaggeration. In fact, I'm incapable of exaggeration. Well, then tell me what's so important about today's date. <laughs> What was the question again? <laughs> oh, well, perhaps you forgot me yourself. Yeah, heavens no. I've been so looking forward to it. As have I. Today, we are celebrating. You bet we are. It's the first time we mm -hmm. have ever celebrated this occasion before. It's a special day. Perhaps an evening. Of great significance. To us both. Naturally. Obviously. Exactly. <laughs> Hold on, us. What? If that had been my band-aid as a kid, you would have told me to shut up and fix it myself. Yeah, is that something you talk about in therapy? Is that all right if I do? Of course. The truth is, I was angry a lot. I was angry. That your father wasn't the person I thought I'd married, and I was angry that I couldn't fix him, and... Uh, Took a lot of that out from you. I'm sorry, Mayor. Oh. Forgive you, Mom. Good. Because I forgave myself a long time ago. Oh. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, don't get upset. <laughs> Ryan, please. No, come on, let's let's not okay. do that. Okay, okay. Right, sorry. I'm sorry. I just, that's, that's what I wish for you, Marianne. 
is that you can forgive yourself for Kevin. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. Yeah, I am. You spoke out. What is this? Why are you showing me this? Because you asked to see it. sophisticated sentient weapon ever made vision's not a weapon you can't do this in fact it is our legal and ethical obligation i just want to bury him that's all i want are you sure you're an orphan beth yes i know that no yes of course you do i was just wondering how you learned to play chess mr shival taught me he was the janitor at Methuen. A janitor taught you how to play? Really? When I was eight? I imagine it must have been such a distraction from life in such a depressing place. I mean, you must have been very lonely. I'm fine being alone. Do you imagine that you saw the king as a father and the queen as a mother? I mean, one to attack, one to protect. They're just pieces. And anyway, it was the board I noticed first. The board? Yes. It's an entire world of just 64 squares. I feel safe in it. I don't understand what's happening to me. Where is he? Where's your dad? Hey, don't sweat it, sis. It's not like your dead husband could die twice. <laughs> Billy. I need you to focus. I can't tell. He sees soldiers. They think he's dying. Um, okay, um, so let's go ahead now and introduce um, our panelists from uh, from WandaVision and Mayor of Easttown. And I think a fun way to do this, um, I'd like to do it kind of like a roll call. Um, and uh, so what I'll do is I'll um, call out your name and I want you to tell us the uh, the nominated episode or series that you wrote. And since this is a celebration of Emmy nominations and a celebration of TV writing, will you also tell us about a TV show, a TV episode, or maybe even a TV character that's been inspiring or meaningful to you on your journey as somebody who writes TV? Um, and I'm gonna go in the order in which we'll later break down the scenes. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with Jack Schaefer. Uh, there she is. Hi. <laughs> I thought you were gonna like ask me to do some sort of like a dance or a cheer or a, like, cause I was thinking celebration, but instead you're asking me to use my brain and remember things. So um, I'm Jack. Uh, I feel like Twilight Zone episode probably um, would be one of the formative ones. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's called Eye of the Beholder, the one where everybody has those crazy sort of pig nose faces. And yep. then in the end, the woman is like, I'm so disfigured, but really I'm, you know, look like a Hitchcock um, heroine. Uh, that blew my mind as a, as a young person. Amazing. Um, all right, so next um, let's introduce uh, Chuck Hayward. 
Yay, Chuck. I feel like I should be cheering, you know, like yeah, everyone's yeah. coming <laughs> to a thing. <laughs> Sorry, Chuck. Everyone has to give a round of applause to the next person in Yes, yeah. there we go. <laughs> Here he comes, come on down. Thank you. Um, I. So I'm sorry, we're, we wrote uh, the all new Halloween spectacular, spectacular, uh, Peter and myself. And I think one of the most influential episodes of television that I was growing up was an episode of uh, Good Times when James, the father, died and they were all about to move to Mississippi and have this great life. And you had Esther roll, yo, damn, damn, damn. But it was like, I, I think, which I think even that was a big deal back then. You weren't allowed to say damn on TV, yeah. but it was just like this family who had just been, you know, crushed by poverty for all this time, finally saw a way out and then it just yanked out from under them. It was, it was, it was. Wow. I love that. Um, yes. uh, let's, let's kick it over next to uh, Peter Cameron. Hey, <laughs> um, I'm Peter Cameron. I'm the other half of the Halloween episode uh, for WandaVision and um, my just just to uh, give another one to Twilight Zone actually the episode where Burgess Meredith uh, has all the time in the world to read and then at the spoiler alert seven years later or whatever uh, breaks his glasses that was <laughs> hell on earth to me when I saw it as a kid like a real oh no worst scenario moment <laughs> it really really stuck with me Love that. <laughs> All right, uh, next let's have uh, Laura Donnie. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, okay, I wrote previously on um, of, of WandaVision um, and I'm gonna pick a character. And um, Good. as I say, I'm like, it feels basic, but it also feels honest. So I'm just gonna go with it. I feel like um, Lorelai Gilmore on Gilmore Girls when, when I was very young, just the speed with which she spoke and the banter with which she spoke was very much, um, it felt like how I talked and to see that that was a legitimate way to, to, to story tell. Um, I think I have kept with me as I try to tell my stories, so. Go more girls. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, let's bring in Brad Inglesby. Ooh, okay, there we go. Hey guys, uh, I'm Brad. I'm the writer of Mayor. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a like specific episode, Lauren. I think the show that um, probably resonated with me the most as a kid and having an interest in writing and reading was probably the wonder years and kevin arnold and and that sort of ability to talk about like you know a life in a, a suburban community and uh all the feelings of friendship and 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 love and 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 so i think that was able to tap into you know, the feelings I was having as a kid, it was able to articulate them in ways that hadn't been articulated, I thought, up until then. And um, and so I think that was a character in a show that resonated with me and got me interested in storytelling in a way at a, at a really young age. That's great. I'm gonna give all of you guys a huge round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, so let's, um, let's talk generally for a little bit. Um, limited series have really come into their own as a television art form over the past decade and i think our audience here consists of you know wga members pre-wga and people who are increasingly drawn to writing in this form um, so my first question to the group um, i kind of want to define the terms uh, what in your opinion makes a story suited to be a limited series as opposed to some other form, like a regular series, a movie, or like even a play. Um, and if you're writing a limited series, what, what are the elements you must have? It's okay, I know this, you know, it takes a little thought. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I mean, I can jump in and say just on, for me, Lauren, it was it was really I had been writing movies my you know, whole career, really, and this was an idea in Mare that felt like it it couldn't really fit into a movie. You know, it felt like it needed a few more hours than a movie would accommodate because it was a story of a community, and um, and yet it had a a very 
you know, it had an ending. It was, it, it had a very specific ending. It had an arc that would end at a certain space. So it, it wasn't a show that I was convinced could be told over years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, you know, I would say those parameters kind of came into, into play. It's, it's longer than a movie, but I don't want to write nine seasons of, of Mare. So is there a limited, so I think it was just a, all the practical considerations is like, this is a story that I think I probably need eight hours to tell and what's a, a format that's gonna allow me to tell that. And I think in, in the case of Mare, it was really an interest in telling the secondary characters that in a movie, it's, it's a case, it's a protagonist, they're trying to solve a crime and you're just not going to get into the lives of the secondary characters in a way that eight hours allows you to. So I think it was like, you know, once I got those ideas out, I only had one way to go. That was like limited series, you know? For sure. I think I think for for WandaVision, that's so interesting. And I, I so agree with Brad that like the the runway for um for character development and for peripheral storylines, like that is so fantastic. I think for WandaVision though, and I don't think I realized this until we were deeper into it and maybe on the other side is, you know, I, like I came up, I, I came from features and I came up worshiping, you know, movies like The Matrix and Memento and Fight Club and, and movies that had these like tectonic twists in them. Um, and I, 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 I feel like our, our current sort of entertainment climate, it's, it's a lot harder to, to pull the wool over the audience's eyes and like have a lot of twisty turnies and like really sort of, um, I don't know, spin people's heads around um, in the feature space. It feels like a lot of the promotional stuff and trailers, like th the jigs kind of up and you really only end up with like maybe one or two like rug pulls and twists that you can do. I'm not saying it's not possible and I still write and love features, but what, what I discovered in WandaVision was we like, we had so much real estate for, for, um, for for big twists and big pivots and and big surprises and and for constantly sort of redefining what it is that what the show is that that we're presenting, um, so I think Wandavision was was specifically suited um, because of that because because like in a in a run of a comic we were able to really kind of like land those cliffhangers um, in a big way. Cliffhangers. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Cool. Um, so uh, TV history was obviously a big influence on the structure and formatting of WandaVision. Uh, we know some of the shows and scripts that influenced you. Um, are there any shows that people would be surprised to know were an influence on the show? And then Brad, were there any shows that influenced or instructed you in creating Mare? Guys, there has to be some weird stuff that we that came up in the room that we can. Uh, well, there's a Teen Wolf too, right? How many times did I reference Teen Wolf too? <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> came up a lot, weirdly. <laughs> no, yeah, I feel like they were all pretty straightforward. I think, like with the the way with the costume design and the set design, and even the direction, it was very particular to, you know, Dick Van Dyke or or. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore or, you know, um, Malcolm in the Middle. Like it just all felt sort of, I don't know, but it felt like exactly what we were going for. So I I think, I'm trying to think if there were any right. randoms. Sorry, I, no, go ahead. I, no, 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 I thought of, I was racking the brain for like what was one that, I, we talked about Russian Doll a lot. Um, and I think we, I think one, it was out right when we were writing. And I also think it like, it, um, for our show, which, was so often about like what we call the weirdnesses, like to just sort of like decide this is the world and allow for it and I and not get over consumed with like following the dots back to logic necessarily. And I feel like as writers, a lot of the time, or at least like I, I feel like I often write like I'm in like a court of law and I'm like, how will I prove that this makes sense if someone <laughs> asks me? 10 years down the line and it's I feel like Russian Doll in the best way was a good example of like some things are just part of your show <laughs> like like some things are just tv and some things are just um, intuitive like intuitive, there was a lot intuitive of intuitive and intuitive and stuff. exactly and also just everyone's along for the ride because 
we are, and I, again, I mean this in the best way, like this is make-believe, like this is imagination time. So, and I feel like with Russian Doll, there were moments where you, if you thought too hard, it could spoil the visceral experience you were having. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, served us a lot in WandaVision, though I do also think we made a lot of sense. <laughs> Brad, anything? Um, you know, I think with I think with Mayor, the show that really, um, it, you know, the show that really stands out to me is an obvious one. Like, I, I used to watch Broadchurch, and that was a show that I watched. That, like, and this is why I just so admire the Wandavision writers because I have no high concept ideas ever. I am like the least high concept writer of, of all time. Like if you were to look at any of the movies I've written or any, or, or even there, there was like absolutely no concept to it. But what I loved about Broadchurch was, I think it gave me the courage to be like, I, it's not a high concept show whatsoever, Broadchurch, really. It's like, we've seen it a million times, just like we've seen Mayor a million times. But what it did was it sort of hugged that in a way. And, and, and embraced it um, and said, but we're still gonna get you so invested in these people that you'll care about them and that will take on an elevated quality. And so while the story is, 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 I would say one you've seen a million times before, how can we tell it in a way that invests an audience? And I think the answer is like in, in the specific of, of the community. So I think it was Broadchurch that really stands out to me as an example of a show that you know, when I watched it on its face, you kind of go, well, well, we've seen this before. Boy turns up dead and what's the procedural elements, but I, it works so much better than all of those others. And what was the magic sauce that went into that show? And I think it was just a commitment to crafting characters that are complex and honest and authentic. Um, and then all the revelations that, you know, all, you know, when all the cards were laid out on the table, everything resonated at such a high level just because the emotional attachment had, all those seeds had been had been laid out in such a specific you know, way, but uh, it, I mean, I it's I have no high concept, so that, that's why I so admire the Wandavision. Come up with these amazing ideas, these, and all of them pay off. And I just sit back and all and watch it because my stories are like a guy, uh, you know, has a trauma in his life. How's he going to get through with it? That's really okay. all my stories in a nutshell. You know, a guy or a woman has something horrible <laughs> happen to them, and it, and the rest of the story, how are they going to deal with it? It's great. Um, well. Uh, I loved um, the complex female protagonists of all the nominated shows this year. And I want to give a quick shout out to Michaela Cole and I May Destroy You and Scott Frank and The Queen's Gambit too, because um, every show nominated in this category had awesome riveting women at the center. Um, so today we're talking about Mayor Sheehan and Wanda Maximoff. Uh, and my next question is, how did you find your way into writing these characters? How did you connect, relate to, or empathize with them in order to get them down on the page? And then on the flip side, what did you find challenging about writing them? Well, first of all, Jack and I are witches. Um, Makes sense. So no, that was just my joke. I don't actually have an answer yet, but I did. It's want a joke, to that, everyone. I did want to get that in there. Uh, I think, um, I mean, I think with someone like Wanda, who has experienced so much loss and trauma, you do have to do an amount of just empathy planning in your body and mind and heart. And, um, you know, really looking at the, we were lucky we had source material, both like, like on a comic page and on the screen and just so we had like existing stuff to to work with but um what was so like easy in a way is that so much of Wanda had been unexpressed in the MCU so far so it actually was just like there was just so much that we got to explore and it was like a welcome, a welcoming character to get to really like dig into. Um, I think the challenge, and I'm curious what the others will say, but I think that the challenge was marrying who we knew as Wanda and then Wanda in her, in her 
sitcom fantasy. And I think that, I think finding the voice of, and I think Jax talked about this, like finding the voice of Wanda in the sitcom, um, mm-hmm. I think was more of a challenge than, you know, getting to finally express all the grief and pain of Wanda Maximoff. It was like, how does that lady talk about, you know, lunch? Um, so. <laughs> wow. I also, um, Jack uh, had the infinite wisdom to uh, have, have the entire writer's room meet with a grief counselor. And so we really got into on a very visceral level, um, how people experience grief, how it manifests itself. And one thing I learned that was so interesting and that I think we definitely applied there was like, you, you know, they say there are the seven stages of grief. And she was explaining to us that like, you can go to, from one to two to five, back to four, back to five again, to three, to seven. So like we really, it gave us, um, a nice uh, framework in order to not have to be so linear with what uh, Wanda was ex- experiencing. So we got to, we, like, like uh, Donnie said, we had a lot of runway to play with. It was also really, it was really refreshing to be on, on a project where the whole time there wasn't a single you know, fellow writer or producer or exec that was describing a female character with like, oh, female, but like badass or like uh, kick ass. You know, it's like we skipped all of those conversations where I feel like I've sat in a room so many times and someone has described a female character with using, you know, know, (laughs) phrases like that. And you just kind of grin and say like, but also, you know, a human being, like a character, right? Like we're gonna get dig a little deeper than, than we might be in this moment, I hope. And often the answer is no. So it was really, it was, a, it was just a whole bowl full of refreshing on that front. That's great. Well, anything else to add? Wait, I, w- I definitely want to yeah. hear about Brad's experience writing. Yeah, Mare. Brad, come yeah. on. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, sorry guys. Um, on Mayor, um, yeah, I think, look, I, I, I think, you know, with Mayor, it was, um, a part of it was, uh, and I don't, I don't know how you guys, you know, ever write things, but uh, I'm curious about this because the way I've written things is I sort of have an idea and then it like often comes from the strangest place because Mayor came from, I had another idea I was working on. I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a cop on the East Coast and he said, I was asking about his life as a, as a cop and he said to me, you know, I used to work out at, at Lancaster area and it was a little station. It was me, 11 other officers, a woman detective, who handled all the all the cases herself and uh it was a a train station that had been converted into the police station and that is like exactly what the station is in mayor of east town and so sometimes it's just like and and so that idea was the nugget that i was like oh one woman at a police station all the crimes come to her and then uh, i think what interested me was uh and I, i was experiencing some stuff with my own uh you know, I had some stuff with my son that was going on with, had to take him to neurologist. So I was experiencing just the fear of what would happen in life if, if these things happen. And, and luckily my son's fine, but it got me thinking to have a child that had a disability, how would I handle it? And then it's just, again, it's just like, it's, I always just feel like it's the aggregate of all these things going on in your life. It's the police station. It's the little nugget someone told me that I put that in the piggy bank. And then it's my own anxiety as a parent I'm going through I put that in the piggy bank and suddenly you look at the piggy bank and you've got a couple a couple dollars to spend and I think with mayor what interested me I grew up in a basketball clan my dad was a basketball player my brother was a basketball player so I've been around this idea of like old glory and what a second life looks like after the glory and you commit yourself to this one goal and listen mayor was never going to be in the WNBA she's not Sue Bird that's not her story but it was interesting. It was a subversion of what we usually see, which is always a male athlete whose life's in at loose ends. And to me, that was an interesting subversion of what we'd seen in the past. So you have this woman who had done this great thing as a teenager whose life after that was really a little bit downhill, a, a little bit of a letdown. And then you had a woman who, as a parent, wasn't a good parent, which you usually see as the dad. The dad's overworked. He's not home. He's out doing things. But in this case, it was the mom. And the dad was actually, he was handling everything. And so it just, you know, it was kind of the aggregate of those things. And then we had a grief therapist too, who was a lovely woman named Ariel who lived on the East Coast and she would 
and she would, and I would ask her a million questions and, um, and she would say, you know, certain ideas that she had, oh, I think Mayor would be going. And again, it's just the aggregate of all that. Um, it made a really interesting character. And Ariel actually was the one, because I, I had a conversation with her, because the end of the show was originally Lori and Mayor on the ground. And uh, early in the process, I said to Ariel, I said, well, I don't, you know, I had this stuff with Mayor. I got to have these conversations. She has with therapists. What would she say? You know, she asked the therapist, oh, would I go? Like, I essentially asked Eric, is there a place Mare would go in an effort to remember her son? And Ariel said, no, I, I would tell her to go back to the attic. She's got to go up to the, and I thought that might be kind of morbid. Like she sits in the attic and, and then we got to think like, no, of course that's the ending. That, that's the most obvious ending. She has to confront the thing that's haunted her. But again, I think like, it's just, it's, so I would say writing Mare was the aggregate of a number of things. My own anxieties as a parent, ideas that I have as a basketball player. And it's just like, you're putting the pennies in the piggy bank. And after a while, like I said, sometimes you look at it and you have a little bit of money to spend and then you start writing and see where it goes. So that was really like how we came to Mayor. And then when Kate comes on board, Kate has her own ideas. And my, uh, you know, and just working with Kate, I always just took her ideas. She knows a lot better than me. So I would always take her ideas the whole time. And the same with Julianne, same with Jean. I, I learned very quickly to shut up and listen to the ladies. They know these things, their mothers, their sisters, they know a lot better than I do. Wow, that's... The whole time you were talking to us, like these are both great shows to be talking about together. Like, they, I was just saying that they're yeah, almost yeah. The same. I mean, they're dealing with similar ideas and themes it's in such so different cool. ways. But you know, it's really all about grief. Wow. Um, and now a fun, mostly unrelated question for the group, um, if you'll permit me. Um, I've just been thinking about this a lot. Um, how do you all name characters when you write? Do you have a process for that, especially when you have these epically huge casts and lots of minor characters? Um, we, yeah, I mean, in the in you know the Marvel universe, we don't get to name characters very often, but when we do, uh, we were really intentional about it. Um, <laughs> the, the the secondary villain character um, in our show is uh, Hayward named after Chuck Hayward. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> um, and then like there were, you know, uh, we, we would we would sort of put it to the group and everybody would get to put their own Easter eggs in. Like Ellis Ave is a is a Peter Cameron touchstone. Um, I mean, that's like not a character name, but- um, The street I grew up on. <laughs> yeah. And so we, so we usually would like collectively would, would use those as an opportunity um, to honor people and honor our past. Um, Agent Monty is named after um, Laura Monty, who is um, a terrific writer and was my assistant on the show. Um, yeah, right guys, is that, that's sort of how we did it? Yeah. And Ralph, I, I think Ralph just made us laugh. Like her talking about, that was like in that time period that, that she appears in the show, her husband would be named Ralph. Right. That, that was was that a honeymooner shout out or was it just a period thing? I feel like it was a honeymooner shout out that stood up in every decade. That's great. But uh, also, Brad, Lauren, oh, yeah, I was sorry. just going to say, sorry, just in general, like, it's funny you ask that because like in writing now, I find my, like outside of WandaVision, like, I like am tormented by picking names for characters in my work yeah. a lot because it's like you it suddenly means a lot, but could mean nothing. And then, so I actually like, um, was talking even with some of the other writers, I feel like just in general, there's a lot of baby name searches. There's a lot of like, you do look up things that could mean something like, and then like work your way back. And it's just like a little secret for you, but because the name field is so expansive, it's a way to narrow it down because otherwise you end up, you're just like, Bob, Mary, like, and it's, <laughs> you know, but it, it is a funny thing because it, it feels like such a big and small thing all yeah. at once. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all over the baby name sites as well. And if it's a last name, I'll try to find what its origin is. Like if, you know, how, how like Smith is usually meant to take your family way back when Bill Smith Smiths of something. Um, and also I read somewhere recently that women who have names that they constantly have to correct people about the pronunciation, they tend to be stronger women because they're they're forced to stand up for themselves longer. So if I want 
you know, a woman to, you know, with a strong word, you know, neighbor, neighbor, something that people either misspell or mispronounce all the time. Um, and then it, other characters, if I want them to have had some childhood trauma, then I'm like, what, what awful nickname would his classmates have given him in seventh grade that would torture him to this day? So it's like, you know, uh, Ralph Boner, for example, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good example of, uh, of, of, of somebody that, you know, had, had faced a little trauma and it does help, it does help inform their character. That's amazing. Brad, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like Laura, like it, it absolutely haunts me. And, and, and I go through like a hundred rounds and then I'll, I'll change the name a million times. You know, there's like a little thing in the, in the software I use, like I have to go and get all the names together and then I look at them and, and just see what stands out. But you know what I do a lot of, because a lot of the stories I write are kind of in a specific region. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll go on like a local high school website and look up the roster of the basketball team and like scan the basketball players. And because that will give you a sense of the names in that community sometimes. And there is a level of like honesty about that, you know, that I like, oh, that person actually exists in this town. It gives me a little bit of, of the courage to say, I, I could see that name, but it, it haunts me. And the only reason I picked Mayor is it's my aunt's name. Her name's Mary and everyone calls her Mayor. I just loved it. I know now uh, I'm worried you think I hate the name Mary, but like, I don't. <laughs> no. I don't love it either. I don't, the truth, but it, I mean, names haunt me. I, I totally agree with everybody. I struggle with them every time I write anything and, and I'll go back and change names a million times. Yeah, that's why I asked because, you know, hoping someone would like drop some pearls of wisdom, um, which this is Actually, great. This is great. Um, I, I share, this is kind of a cheat, but I also like try to make the, the names as different from one another as possible. So when whoever's reading it is reading it, it's not like, Kevin and, and Kayla and you know uh, it just helps people read it and get into it a little bit easier so I'll, I'll do like names that start with different letters like a long name versus a short name and so it just it just helps me that's a little trick no, I agree with that Chuck I always I always play that game with myself are these two names too similar am I going to differentiate these two people I'm always playing that game myself cool um okay so let's let's um I want to talk about plotting a limited series and I specifically want to hone in on the element of mystery. Um, to me it seems like limited series usually have kind of a great mystery at the center of them and these two shows definitely have that. Um, can you talk about that element in your shows and um, where did you start and how did you build it out? I feel like Brad should go first on this one. Starts with a dead body. <laughs> I'll jump in. I mean, my it's a it's a great question, Lauren. I, it's like I had like I learned on the fly. It was a constant. I was constantly revising things. Or like and again, I would also say a lot of this was done in the edit, where you watch an episode and go, especially a mystery murder mystery. We were always going, you know. But I I think the important thing I would say is is identifying an ending of each episode and identifying where you want the audience to be in terms of, of their suspicion. Um, and that was important, but I, you know, I, even from the beginning, I think it was most important to identify like who the killer was, why it happened, and then the themes of that, how do they resonate with Mayor? I think the most important thing was this, like it took me a long time to even start writing because I didn't know where the show was gonna end. And then I, like, I, I guess I was convinced that Mayor was such a, stubborn person to get her to confront the thing that's haunting her which is the death of her son you know once you got to the end of the mystery it could it had to be surprising but it also had to be like crushing emotionally because if it was just surprising mary would go on with her job but it had to like crush her in such a way that it would get her to go to the attic and so that it was like like I didn't have many options because what was a crushing ending that was surprising? Oh, it has to be Lori. Like, of course that's, and then, and then the theme of that made sense because Mayor's lost the son and Lori's helped her through it. And now Lori's losing a son in a different way, but she's losing the son and Mayor has to help her through it. So the theme of that, it was strong. And so if I knew that was where it had to end, then I was able to go back and go, okay, I, like, how do I get there in a convincing way? I think the really hard part with Mayor, and it was the thing we really struggled with is like, you know, and Jack said it earlier, everyone is so, everyone knows all your tricks now. There's no way to trick anybody, right? Everyone's so, uh, 
it, it, it's just so educated in in the TV and the storylines. And there, it's just so hard to trick people. And so the trick that we always had in the edit and even in the writing was that it had to be a surprise. And yet you had to know the character so that when so when the reveal happens, you care about them. So it's easy to trick somebody and go, hey, it was the guy in the bar in episode one. If you blinked, you missed them. Like that is a way to surprise people. But, but when you get to that reveal, it doesn't resonate in any way emotionally. And so the trick we were always playing is like, it has to be someone we know and care about. And yet we have to hide them enough. And, you know, just so when you get to the reveal, it's a surprise. And how do you balance knowing them? I think the... I think the the ace we had was Julianne because we were able to hide Ryan a little bit, but we loved Julianne because she's such an amazing, effortless actress. So that even when you got to Ryan, it was the crushing blow that it was Ryan, but more so you were attached to Lori as a character that you felt all her pain. And so that was huge because we had a great actress in Julianne who we knew could absolutely crush those scenes. And she did, and she's amazing. But I think it was trying to balance like, you know, it's got to be a surprise and also has to be emotional. So how do you hide the, how do you hide the suspect, but you can't hide him enough. You, you know, he has to be in the show enough that when it's, that it actually happens. So that was the balancing act we were always playing in the edit and the storytelling was how do we keep it a surprise, but also, you know, it's got to be emotional. So that was, so that I, I think I, in terms of the structure, that was the hardest, I think that was the hardest trick we had to pull off. Yeah. I think for I think for us, and I'm going to make my colleagues talk more because um, I'm talking too much. But um, uh, I think that that it was like the the project arrived to me um, like partially baked because it was the idea of Wanda processing her grief like through creating a false sitcom world. So what what wasn't figured out is like all the rules of that, which was I think for us a large percentage of the fun was figuring out those rules. Um, but what we tried to do, like it, we knew, I, I mean, part of my pitch was like, you can't do this linearly. You can't, you can't do, hey, it's the end of, you know, Endgame and Wanda's pretty bummed and she goes to this town and like has a grief explosion and creates a false reality. There's no tension in that. So, um, so part of my initial pitch was like, how, how do we create this as, as a mystery? Um, how do we turn this into a puzzle box? And so the first, you know, the first act, essentially the first three episodes is, um, is Wanda doing this or is this being done to her, right? So that's sort of how we figured it out is what are those questions along the way and where do we want our, our audience to be? Where are the red herrings? Um, and we, you know, we had, we had a hard time once, once we sort of give up the ghost that Wanda's behind it, we had to sort of um, double down on the tension and the mystery of, um, of the series. And I'm gonna stop because you guys know what I'm talking about. Peter, talk about this. Or if Peter's nervous, <laughs> Chuck. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we talked to, oh, right under the bus, Jack Schaefer. <laughs> but but dead on, but appropriate. Absolutely right. Um, I remember we talked a lot about um, how it wasn't enough to turn cards without emotion. Like that first question that you were talking about for the first three episodes. Like, I think we talked a lot about, about how that would build an audience cachet of identifying with her if we thought something an external force was, you know, putting pressure on her. And by the time we hopefully built up that emotional currency, you know, just sort of making sure each card realigned the audience's um, point of view, as well as their feeling about the entire show and what could lie ahead and every character in it. Um, I'll, I'll say too, uh, we, there was great debate over how long our episode, how long our audience would stick around in this world of mystery without knowing exactly what it is since it's so atypical in terms of Marvel fare. Um, and I, I was dead wrong. I was like, I don't think we got more than two guys. I don't think we can hold people on. And I, I'm so glad that uh, Jack and Kevin stuck to their guns and were like, nah, man, we, we have built up some capital as Marvel. People know some good shit's coming. Just, you know, <laughs> like, like play with them for a while, make them earn it. And I, I, <laughs> that, I learned a huge lesson about that. So yeah. I'm happy to have been wrong this one time. <laughs> I'll I'll also say that like again just because it's been, it was such a unique experience I for me I'll speak for myself but like because we had a lot of given circumstances given to us um we also like had no matter what the mystery of like what is vision 
And so I feel like even like, no matter, like as far as like the engine of mystery, we like, I think we're very lucky that as long as we like held on to that reveal, there was always, whether we were asking it through him or whether the audience is just asking it themselves, like we had this like jewel stone, sorry, (laughs) of, um, you know, a, a mystery of like, there is, and also sort of the most like basic mystery of like what's gonna happen like once we know that Wanda is doing it it's it's just sort of like and now what because and and in some ways that's just like the a huge obviously open-ended question but it it allowed us to answer some mystery like at the end of act one as Jack says and then still get the engine of supplementary mystery Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so start your show with a character that died in a movie is the way to do it (laughs) all right I had one more question but I think I'm going to save it for the end because I want to make sure that we have time to really kind of dive into these um script pages so Kat if you're paying attention um we are going to, uh, I think, let's start with Jack um, and filmed live before a studio audience. Um, so we're gonna get these pages up here, cool. Um, so the one thing, um, the one thing I wanna know uh, from everybody, so everyone can kind of start to like marinate on this. Um, Uh, So we've got this sample. It's, you know, we're starting on page four here. Um, I think this is the clip we saw. Um, Why did you choose this specific scene um, to share with us? Um, Yeah, I, I think because um, it's, it's the, it's the crux of the whole show. Um, You know, these, these two characters don't know what's going on. They don't know how they got here. It's the larger, it's the, it's the Uber mystery of the show. And it's also the crux of the episode. It's also what's called like the trouble um, of, I I mean, I just learned that um, in, 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 in sitcom speak. Um, and, and I think that what we endeavored to do with our show is to, as, as much as we could align what's really going on in the show for Wanda emotionally, psychologically, um, narratively with, um, what's going on in the sitcom world. Um, and I, so that, you know, that was a big part of what we were doing. And then I, I just loved, this was sort of my first experience writing for the two of them in sitcom mode and they we were trying to do um dick van dyke and mary tyler moore and it was supposed to be fizzy and sweet and like bubbly and and i i I, you know i i have written romantic comedies like i i sort of know how to do that but to like it gave me such a perverse thrill to like do it inside of the mcu (laughs) that's so cool um so I want to, I've got this question here, um, jumping off of what you said um, about, you know, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore and their kind of their rhythm. Um, uh, Kat, let's go down to, um, it's, it starts kind of at the bottom, they're, they're back and forth at the bottom of page five um, to, to kind of the top of um, page six where they're finishing each other's sentences. Um, I, w- I just wanted to know if you could speak to kind of like the significance of their being so in tuned here that they're literally finishing each other's sentences? Yeah, I mean, I was really going for a, like a literal rhythm, you know, like that, like the pattern of these shows, you know, they felt very, they felt like plays, they felt very musical. There was often music and dancing. Um, and so I don't normally like say my lines, out, like my dialogue out loud, like I'm not one of those writers that's like saying it to myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but this was one where I did, I was like muttering it. Like I was sort of like doing a thing back and forth because it needed to like have a rhythm back and forth. And it also needed to, Paul is, um, is English. And so it it also needed to sound like Peter O'Toole a little bit. Um, so yeah. And I, I, it was, there was a where I felt kind of like adrift and what are we doing and is this right and what's happening with the mystery and my head hurts and what's going on and this was one where I, I felt like really in the pocket which is yeah. always as any writer knows is a good feeling yeah that's great um 
So tell me, just kind of tell me about writing this, like the, the technical process of writing this episode. Um, how do you write? Were there a ton of drafts? Not very many. What time of day do you write your best? Tell me all that stuff. Sure. So we, um, so I, uh, this is, so this is my first TV show. So we had been in the room for like 12 weeks or something, guys. I don't remember when we, it was a little longer than that, when we were like, okay, now is the time when you break. And I went away to write the pilot. And I was like, great guys, see you in a minute. <laughs> um, and then I went to an office and, and drew a complete blank. Actually, what I did was, is I, I knew like the, we, we had broken it pretty well. I knew what the beats were. So I like, I cheat and I'm like, hey, here are all the slug lines. And hey, here are the cute, all the cute little lines that I was planning to put. And like, ooh, here's the one where he chokes and I know how that's gonna look and what that's gonna feel like. So I'll write that, like you write all the easy stuff. And then it's like basically like a carcass that's like been picked over by, by vultures. And then it's like, oh crap, how is this gonna work and hang together? Um, and the thing, the problem I ran into really quickly was I was I actually didn't have this, um, this like the heart on the on the wall like I knew there would be a miscommunication um, and I panicked so I called Laura Donnie and Mackenzie Dore and our writer's assistant Clay Perry in and I put them in a room and I was like give me some ideas <laughs> <laughs> um, and they did they came up with like a whole bag because they're they've been in rooms and they know how to do this and they came up with a whole bag of, of ideas that were like sort of all different moving pieces but the idea of a heart and a person who is a heart and then I think they had a separate idea that had to do with the calendar. And so I think those became married and then that's what I was missing. And then I was able to keep writing. Um, this was the, epi this was the, the episode that had the least am amount of revisions um, mm -hmm. of all of them. I think because it sort of was what it was like, and it's, it's the shortest one and it's sort of, yeah, it just was like, this is, this is how we're launching this in this totally bizarre way. And, and, we'll see you down the line a little right, bit. Right, right, so I think right. it had like, uh, like, I don't know, eight or nine revisions total. Cool. Um, and then, um, Kat, can you just kind of just do like a, a, a really pretty like scroll through this so people can see the formatting um, and how make it's Make it pretty, formatted. Kat, make like, it pretty. Make it, it's got, but it's gotta be pretty. Um, <laughs> she's trying, bless. You're doing um, a great job. <laughs> looks good to me. Um, so, so people can kind of see that this is this is formatted like Dick Van Dyke. Um, and what I'm wondering is, um, you know, when you initially wrote this, did you write it in that format, or was that something that came about later? Yeah, a hundred percent. That was always the plan, and all of my colleagues did the same. Um, it was our way of communicating to all of our creative partners on the show, from production design to our director to the actors, what mode we were in at any given time. So um, uh, Laura Monte, my assistant, she pulled a bunch of scripts from um, uh, from the library. Did she yep. speak with you directly, Lauren? Um, I, I vaguely remember, what I remember about that, it's like someone from Marvel once- It might've been like all secrety. And, and like, yeah, yeah, and it was like, and Sorry. look at scripts from these like classic sitcoms. And I was like, what? Like- right. I, Which I, is like I, men in I, suits like, drop down I and like put a bag over your head. I couldn't put the, like put it together that this could possibly be for a project. Right. And I was like, what do they want to look at that for? Um, <laughs> yeah. She, yeah, well, she was yeah. told that you like, so she had to Xerox them. Is mm -hmm. that a thing? Do we Xerox anymore? And so she brought them in in these big binders mm -hmm. and we were all like, whoa, look at this from the olden times. Um, <laughs> and I remember that they, like you could see that they were typed. Like there was a little bit of blur like on the words from it being on whatever kind of paper it was on. And there was a moment where I was like, we're going to type these and then realize that <laughs> we super don't have time for that. Um, but yeah, that was always the design. And then like, it, it, as the episodes yeah. progressed, like we moved from this, like some of like the sitcom format, like shifted a little bit mm -hmm. as, um, as they became more present day. I think it's like, right, you guys, it was like double space to, it, this is, this is like 1.5. And then it was like, I don't remember. Anyway, we were really specific about it. Um, am I back? My internet, it said my internet was unstable for a minute. Oh, you seem very stable. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> very stable. Um, I, uh, okay. Um, so I have, I have, uh, two more questions for you. Um, and, uh, the first of them is how do you, um, how do you set the tone and get everything across without getting bogged down 
or giving too much away in this first episode. And was there anything, I mean, across those like seven or eight drafts that like you cut or that changed drastically? I don't, I think we, we cut a lot of the fat in the room. I think we had more ideas about like more scenes and more opportunities like in the domestic, like I think there was more sort of jumping back and forth between Wanda at home and vision at work. But I think we were all really cognizant of the fact that we need to keep this like moving. Like people are gonna get really impatient. Um, and, and I also, I, I, I don't know, I had, a, I had an instinct, a, a really strong instinct. And when I watched the, I just watched it with some friends who wanted me to do like a DVD commentary while we were watching it. And so I hadn't seen it in a while, but there's all, there, it's the same moment um, in the pilot when like right before she flies the um, food out to land on the table, like that's always the moment when me as the, you know, created for television by, I'm like, oh wait, we're still watching a Marvel show. Like it's always right there that you get super lulled into, hey, it's a sitcom, right? It's a sitcom. And and that, so there was, there was some calculus in my mind and I'm rarely like, hey, I knew it all along, but this was one thing that I did know that there was in my gut. I'm like, it's gotta be X long and X amount in order to, to make the audience like completely lulled and surrendered to it. And then we pulled the rug out from under them. Got it. So instinct is the super short answer to that question. <laughs> um, okay, so my, my, last, my last little question here is, um, I mean, what, what is the heart on the calendar really about for you? Oh, great, great question. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's Wanda's love, right? It's her love for vision. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, it's her heartache. It's her grief. It's her everything. And it's, it's the inside of herself that like, doesn't know what's going on, but really does know what's going on. And she has to create an excuse. She has to create a fiction um, mm -hmm. that is sweet and palatable and fun. And, um, and this is what she did is she threw her heart on the calendar and then kept going with the plot. Um, that's how I feel about it. What do you guys, can I quickly ask my writers what they, yeah, 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 what they think? What do, you, do you, what do you, what is it for you guys? Yeah, to me, it was, it was Wanda writing their story and, you know, and as writers do, sometimes we don't always, <laughs> we don't always tell the story completely. Sometimes we're like, oh, I forgot to like tie that up. But like, I think, and I think in that moment, she was like, I got to create something to uh, appease this man as he's, as he's inquiring. And um, I think that she got, she kind of got caught off guard. It's like when, when a, studio or network gives you a note and you don't have an answer for it. <laughs> You're like, I, some, uh, you know, let me get back to you on that. That's great. Um, uh, well, Chuck, since you just spoke, let's, um, thank you, Jack. That was, that was amazing. Thank um, you. And let's, uh, let's bring up um, All Night Halloween Spooktacular and, uh, and let's talk about that. Um, so while she's while she's uh, prepping the pages for that, I'll ask you guys um, why this scene. Why are you sharing this one with us? Uh, the uh, yeah, you know what scene it is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, for me, it was kind of like it, it featured both of our favorite line, um, where Evan says, uh, "You know, you can't kill your you know, your dead husband can't die twice," and it also showed a couple different stages of grief for Wanda in one. And, you know, it, it was the, it was the, you know, the denial and the bargaining and then, you know, the anger and like, and to me, I thought that was such a, it was such an um, all encompassing moment um, where she's sort of confronted with, I know I've been handling this as best I can, but maybe my best isn't enough. I need to buy some time. So it was a really, I think it was a really transitional moment for her. Um, Peter, you want to, did I? Yeah, no, I, um, my PS on that would be would be to brag on you, Chuck. Like uh, that was Chuck's line. He wrote the you know it's not it's not like your dead husband can die twice. And I feel like it's one of those lines that is what the mission statement was in the room. Uh, even though we didn't talk about it that much, it's like the the lines to stick with Marvel are the ones that do it all, so to speak, is what I've noticed. Like I love you three thousand is a is a great line that relies on you having watched a gajillion movies before the thing you're watching right now but then if you haven't still have that emotional resonance yeah. and also hit like a marvel a distinctly marvel tone that is also somehow completely earnest 
Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, half intentionally, half not intentionally, I think that line does it, honestly. I, I, think, it, I think it's one of those, like, it, it's such a throwaway, callous, sneaky thing to say, and it has layers of backstory. And I think, um, you know, you nailed it, Chuck. I was, that was, that's my favorite line in the script. Like, I just, I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like looking at it as you're talking about it. And I'm like, wow, wow. Um, okay, um, so I, um, let's, let's jump into this question, the, uh, the technical question that tell me about writing this episode and give us some, some nice details about um, how you wrote it and especially about how you collaborated. Uh, so it was, we it, we did it kind of piecemeal. So I, I did sort of the first version of it, and then Peter was writing a different episode, and then we kind of combined those two episodes. So um, you know, bits and pieces were you know, Frankenstein is the wrong word because that usually indicates a lack of quality, and I think it turned out very well. But uh, it's <laughs> yeah. definitely a, a, a stew, a, like a nice, a, a lovely stew of both of our ideas and both of where our our, our portions of the script fit together, and. Yeah, I, I just it was it was great. I I enjoy writing with a partner, so having another voice come in and add to it and, and spice it up to me, I think is great. And Peter is so fantastic at all the like when he describes the way that vision's moving through the through the uh, boundary, and it's his his lyric it, it's lyrical his writing his, his his action lines. And I'm I'm pretty much just a comedy writer, so I've always been told like as little action lines as possible like don't you know just as much as they need for the information and then get to the <laughs> get to the dialogue uh and so it, it he i learned from him how to sort of slow down and really like talk on a granular granular level about what is what him stepping into this new world feels like what does it look like to the audience and what is he kind of going through as as he experiences it so um, I that was really uh, all that stuff. I mean, I wish I wish you could see more of it because it's like it was pretty dope. Peter, was, was there anything that you learned from Chuck? Yeah, I mean, if I had written if I had written the sitcom scenes, let me tell you, they would be overwrought. <laughs> and <laughs> jokes would be fifty percent less funny. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean what. I mean, it's it's the opposite compliment, honestly. It's like what um, what Chuck does with brevity and speed, and and just internalizing the, the like the rate of what the pattern should be in any given decade. I was just really impressed by. It. Like he was he was able just to toggle back and forth when we were in the room and kind of nail tone, like he was like he was teleporting through the decade. <laughs> Guys, they're gonna, they, they sound a little, little something like this, you know, this, this time of comedy writing. And um, that was just super impressive. Yeah. yeah. Just to, just to uh, emphasize that point a little bit more, uh, when, when I handed in one of the versions of, of the script, Jack was like, can you just Peter Cameron it up a little bit more on these things? So like, meaning like make it, make them really visceral and make them really sing. So yeah, I, I just got a little, a little lesson. It's that comes insane. out of anxiety though. That comes out of me sitting there and going like, oh, I want it to I want it to look like what's in my head, but oh, I better just give them everything so that it comes <laughs> out like kind of like it what's in my head. <laughs> like, well, there were there were two things here and where we happen to be um, you know frozen on one of them right now in the script. Um, and it it is it's it was striking to me when I was looking at it here on page 34 in the description. Um, I mean, we all watched that clip, you know, where she's like, Boo, like, it's this big, like, epic thing. And it's described on the page, like, off this, Wanda summons her powers. She freezes every soul in the town square. And then, and I feel like, like, in a different script, I mean, there would be tons and tons of detail packed into there. But it's so, it's, you know, written like a sitcom, this big moment. Um, and I just thought that was interesting and wanted to point that out. Um, and um, there was one other, can you guys hear this fire truck that's passing right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, we'll just let let's it pass. See. We'll just let yeah. it pass. Um, right. And uh, let's see. Um, the other thing I wanted to note too, like in the script, um, and it's, it's right here on page 34. If you scroll just a tiny bit, Kat, so we can see a little more of it. 
what I what kind of blew my mind about this script um, is how it jumps when when you're in Westview, you know, you're in that um, that sitcom world. Um, and then when you're in, then you, you know, you go into, uh, you know, Monica's vehicle and suddenly the formatting is no longer like a sitcom. Um, and that just, um, I don't know, I just, I just thought that was super, super cool. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you guys have any, you know, commentary on that, um, the, the formatting specifically. I mean, I, I think our hope was that it was as jarring on the page as it, it would be to cut, you know, mm -hmm. visually, you know, just, just the, again, the tones and rhythms and color palettes are so different. And then, then they, and then they switch in a blink of an eye and just, um, I don't know. Yeah. We were very, very, very conscious about when we cut back and forth between these things, or at least we tried to be just to make sure they <laughs> have a, have a real punch. That's very cool. Um, and uh, the other thing, um, so this episode too, um, when I was watching it, I was like, man, um, and it's it's funny that you mentioned um, the Twilight Zone, Peter, earlier, um, because this episode really has some Twilight Zone vibes. Um, and I wondered, did you kind of, did you, when you were writing this, did you guys look at that show or, or shows of that ilk? I remember watching, um, what's that one, Monster on Maple Street. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I revisit, I mean, a lot of it is for better or worse, like, well, for better, but for worse for my social life, like so ingrained in my head um, that, that there wasn't a lot of revisiting that had to be done. It's, it's, it's in the DNA on some level, but like, I, I remember pitching Twilight Zone stuff as hard as I could. And, and, and there were a couple other writers in the room that were, that were always like, let's go darker. And then everyone else with good sense would be like, yeah, but like not that dark. <laughs> and, and pull it back to where it should be. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then um, I specifically, uh, um, Peter, I remember you, I watched the um, Inside the Writer's Zoom WandaVision WGF thing that we did a, like a month ago um, and um, I, re I remember hearing you say that um, you wrote that that argument scene between Wanda and Vision in the previous episode, um, and you wrote it first without them having superpowers. Does mm -hmm. this ring a bell? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, um, and I was wondering um, because there's a bit of that, you know, even in this sample. I don't know, Kat, if we can if we can find, you know, where where Billy's kind of describing like what he's seeing. Um, and I was wondering kind of how you approached, um, how, how you in this episode, you know, like approached, um, you know, these super, super beings. Um, do you, you know, is, is that something that you always did when you were writing this, like write them first without? No, um, I think, I think in this case, it was, it was from the room, it was from Jack and all of the other writers of just, you know, when is it, when is a power burst going to be emotional? You know, like just tying it into emotion so that because with, with Marvel and, and every other major studio, it, it will look beautiful. The visual will be there, you know, and, and just making sure that it matters when it happens it is our conversations that we had or just sort of, or just sort of goals of, you know, let's not, let's not spend money unless it's going to matter inside someone's heart, you know? Mm. Yeah. And then we talked a lot in that regard about Bewitched because that, that was Darren's whole thing was like, no magic in front of other people. You know, we got to <laughs> pretend to be normal here. So I think, yeah, she only used her, you know, her, Wanda only used her power as, in, as a last resort. And when the chips were all the way down and she needed to reestablish control. That's, oh, that's awesome. Um, well, thank you guys. This uh, that was great. Thank you. Um, and let's uh, let's bring Laura Donnie's sample previously on. Um, Sad I have uh, to do it alone. It yeah, you got to do so it alone. unfair. All right, hot seat. Um, so my first question for you, um, it's literally, I mean, it's the same question that I've been asking everyone, but it's it's written into this sample where she says, "What is this? Why are you showing me this?" <laughs> And my answer is the same because you asked to see it. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually, so for a couple reasons, this scene is very special 
to me for a couple of reasons. And um, some are like selfish and some are less selfish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so first of all, it's, it had a lot of, I feel like responsibility on it because this is the start of our story. So when we were talking in the room about like, what is the thing that sends Wanda to, you know, make the hex? Like, and this is that first, I mean, domino that falls in that sequence. And so figuring out like, okay, well, she's already like killed Vision in Endgame, then to see him come back to only die again. And so the sort of like, what's what's worse and the challenge of like, what could be the most heartbreaking thing um, was, felt like a big responsibility. And I feel like, I, I just feel very like, proud in this weird sick way of what we came up with and the sort of like honor of getting to put that on the page um and um really visually too so now I'm glad I talked about Lorelai Gilmore because like I am such a like dialogue -y writer and so to be entrusted with a very like visual moment and how and how to make it clear before it's super clear of what we're looking at um intimidated me and so then like the selfish thing is like and I'm really proud of it <laughs> because yeah. it was hard to do and I feel like I did it um <laughs> and uh but also I like did. thank you Lauren um <laughs> but also like and there was an amount of catharsis in that moment for me too like you know think like the whole all the beautiful show that came before this is like asking all the questions and you know my episode like gave a lot of answers and this was like one of the answers like one of the bigger answers and so like to get to like put on the page like the heartbreak like that what is that worst thing oh it is see you know it's identifying the body it's 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 the dehumanization of vision um, and so just like, again, like having to do so much of that in action lines, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, what's that? I see it looks like an arm. Oh no. You know, whatever that right. version of this episode would have been, um, was, you know, a, a challenge that ended up being a very meaningful challenge to me. And then the other thing I will say is that like this scene, I think is the scene is really important to me emotionally because I feel like Wanda Maximoff and all her MCU life is is this person who you know she's misunderstood she tries to do the right thing you know and it all it ends up going wrong a lot for her but it, her intentions are often good um and I think what I want to flag here that's so important to me is like she tried to process her grief. She tried to, to grieve her partner and this man would not let her. And so it's in this moment where not only does he like deny her that, he makes her doubt herself when, when he's like, are you sure? And I feel like that's just such a, it for me, the reason it's such an important moment is because that is the, the click in that I think begins our drive to the house and to ultimately her making the hex, the like she, he plants, he plants that in her so easily and she's so vulnerable and she does just want to bury her partner and, and, and then they don't let her. Um, and so it was, I just feel like it's a really, it's an important scene for Wanda and for us and for me as a writer and having to, um, yeah, to really get a lot across um, yeah. with, and obviously Elizabeth Olsen, it's all on her face. Um, and so that's very lucky, um, not lucky, <laughs> that's talent. Yeah. Um, but but to, to, to try to give her that to, to then do so beautifully, which she did. Um, so I had, I had a kind of a burning question for you with, with this episode. Um, 
the episode as a whole was there like a template that you had for this because at this point you know tv history and the show has kind of been like exhausted um was there something that you kind of like looked to as your like I don't know. Like, a, like yeah, a- it was Gilmore Girls. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, I mean my so Jack's uh, directive on this, and what th- like this is us entering the MCU, but mm-hmm. TV version. So I I am grateful that in that way I did not sort of have as much homework for my episode as far as a, a proper template, except the movies and just film and you know like regular TV. Um, and so, uh, it, it was really like getting to step into, you know, the base world, I guess, in the other episodes of the show into that world. Um, and also like other writers in the room would say things, you know, I've seen, I obviously have seen flashback episodes of things and other writers were use the phrase memory palace and I'd be like what um and you know but you know it was it's that it's it's it you know the look back the Mm -hmm. the um the I guess like now when I'm really thinking about it it's also you know like it's it's um the ghosts of Christmas past That's, I the whole time I was watching it I was like Christmas Carol yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I think that yeah. was probably like my um like that a very on sort of like a surface level like oh yeah that's what we're doing we are walking back in time looking so sure yeah. um okay and you've answered most of my questions which is really really good which um means I talked a lot Sorry. so no it's, it's really great um but I just want to <laughs> ask you um uh, just because I've been asking everyone, um, your your process as a writer, um, and um, you know, kind of just like how on a technical level you wrote this episode, and and yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, I was again like I was very grateful and do feel felt like lucky that that Jack entrusted me with this episode. One because of like all the like delicious story that was in it, but also it did require the least amount of me having to like inhabit like TV that like again felt (laughs) scary. Um, And so, so it did sort of, it it did sort of stand alone in that way, which also meant that like a lot of things would change in the show a lot, but it would not really affect my app. So, you know, when things move in one episode, that's often means something is moving in the following episode. And sometimes you have to retrofit and, and all of that stuff. But mine got to um, just sort of exist in its own little world. And so to that end too, I also got to write it out of order um, because we, we knew we broke as a room what our flashbacks were gonna be and, and what memories we were gonna go to. And Agatha's origin story also could kind of stand alone that um, I feel I just got to write like what I felt when I felt moved to whatever memory that's where I got to spend time and it was and the chronology didn't confuse me because they were all sort of standalones and obviously there were bridges between them and 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 all of that good stuff Um, but but yeah like I it's it's it w- I was allowed to kind of I feel like I got to do the like abstract painting version of an episode mm-hmm. and because you at like I will say I also like to write in the morning there we go I, I love that I feel you. like you asked a version of Thank that you. yeah <laughs> like 5 I- p.m I, I just want to say oh I want Chuck to talk and then I also want to okay. say like I notoriously in my own head I don't know if anybody like giving like getting a note in the evening like crushes me more like the same note if this if I'm getting a note at 10 a.m I'm like beautiful note amazing I want to change that and if you give me that note at like 7 30 I'm like <laughs> everything's wrong and everything so it is interesting that I I can't I'm way less open <laughs> by the end of the night yeah. writing I was I was just gonna sing your praises a little bit and say that like I, there, I don't think there was ever any any thought of who would write this episode because Donnie had this amazing ability to all throughout the series every day like look at she, she's so emotionally intelligent and has 
a, an emotional vocabulary that is like, it's so healthy and it's so <laughs> analytical. And so she would be able, any scene we were talking about, any episode, any character, would just be able to get into where the, the, the brain was in that scene and also where the heart was in that scene and, and make sure that they were both, we were being true to both. So I know you'd never say that about yourself. So I just had to uh-huh. That's so nice. <laughs> that's great um okay now we're going to switch gears and we're um we're going to thank brad inglesby for his patience and we're going to talk now about mayor of east town um let's see let's see um so i'm gonna ask you the question too brad why this scene oh goodness i i don't even remember why i picked it now i think it's probably just a uh uh epitomizes what the show is in many ways, which is, um, you know, about these generations of women living together, trying to deal with uh, trauma in different ways. And I think it's in the structure of this episode, it's probably like, it's planting the seed in Mayor's head that she needs to do something about this, that she needs to activate, or she, or she needs to do something active. Um, you know, which ultimately is what pays off at the end of the show with her going up to the attic. And 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 I think I, I always, I like the scene because at the end of it, it's a group scene, it's about a family and then everyone kind of clears out and we're left with the three women that um, in my mind, when I first started writing the series was what interested me. Like these three women, these three generations under one roof, there's a lot of resentment and how are they gonna cut uh, a path ahead and what that and what is that going to look like? And this scene, to me, because Siobhan's there as well, epitomizes that journey. And it's the first, I would say, it's a step in the right direction after a very hard, hard journey. And uh, yeah, so I think I think that's pretty much why I picked it. Cool. Um, and then um, where, like, where in the writing process um, did this scene come about? Like, when did you know that you were going to include it? And and um, I have another question that kind of relates to that. Um, can you can you plan an emotional scene like this, like in your outline? Are you like, and now uh, you know the mother and daughter and granddaughter will have a reconciliation, or do you like have to leave room to be surprised for what happens? I I mean I'm not an outliner. I've I've never outlined anything. I I don't know how to do it. Um, I went to graduate school, they hammered outlining. It's just never been something that I'm able to do. And listen, I admire people that can do it because for me, outlining has always been a problem because when I get to actually writing the script, I feel like I'm just, it's, it's a shopping list and I'm just inputting the shopping list into the computer. Whereas like the way I've done it uh, is, uh, is I'll just have some ideas that I like. I know where a story sort of starts. I know a couple ideas that happen in the middle that I like and sound cool. And then I know where it ends. And then I, I jump into writing because I always, I like the discovery of it that you think characters are going to go one way and, and, and then they tell you something else and you need to listen to them. And so, I mean, I shouldn't say I don't outline at all. I think I have some ideas. I sort of say, I, oh, I have a I know Zabel's going to die at the end of this episode, or I, I know Mayor's going to do this at the end of the series. So I definitely have ideas, but I've never been a real outliner. And because I just love getting into it and, and discovering things about the characters that I didn't expect to happen, or you just get into writing and you kind of go, oh, well, wow, that's a, a better line than what I imagined. And so that's my process. But you know that doesn't work for every writer, and I always think whatever gets you to the end of the script is the right is the right way. I'm I'm not a guy that's going to give any writing advice because I've made so many mistakes <laughs> on my own that like I just do what works in my world. And, and so with I, this with this kind of like you know which is which in this episode is like one of several kind of like cathartic like scenes. It's just yeah. something you're just sitting there writing it, and it just kind of like comes about. No, I think you know I think it's a very careful like. I shouldn't say like in my head, I would say the emotional I'd say, ramp of the show is mapped out. So I shouldn't say that like I'm just saying, I go, oh, well, you know, what's going to happen? Now? Oh, let's get the family at like a little diner thing. You know, I, you know, I know I have to get Mayor up to the attic and Mayor's a stubborn person. So like, what are the things that slow? So it can't happen in one scene. It has to like, I, I have to have planted a number of seeds along the way. And Helen saying this to her is a big one, is a is a massive one. So it's like, I, I know I need that. 
And if I planted enough of those little nuggets, and then obviously the thing with Julianne and Lori is huge. But so I, I kind of know emotionally where I have to get mayor. And then the question becomes on a practical level, like what are the things that need to happen to get a character like mayor up to the attic in a believable, honest way? Because she's been so, you know, it's, it's a defiance that she has all throughout the series to confront this thing. So it's like, how do you get a person that's kind of been really stubborn about it? How do you get them up to the attic? And I thought that this was a scene that would help us get there. And it's coming from the mother that hasn't really shown any emotional awareness, even though we know she has it because it comes out in the scene to you know what Mare's going through. And so it felt like that there was some recognition in Helen's part and that that would be another crumb, another nugget, another way to get Mare up to the attic. And it would take a few of those to get her there at the end. So that's why I think it's important. And also Siobhan's there and just seeing the generations together, I think is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you uh, so you wrote this totally on your own. Um, my, I mean, my question for you is how did you know if you were on the right track? I mean, did you have anybody that you kind of communicated with during the process who gave you input or how did that go? No, I mean, I, you know, I think kind of, you, you know, you don't really know. I mean, I've <laughs> written plenty of awful things. I mean, trust me on that. Like I've written plenty of terrible things, but you know, I think sometimes if I, you know, a big thing, I don't offer a lot of writing advice. The only thing that's ever worked in my writing life is like, I have to know the ending. I just have to know the end. If I know the ending, then I feel like I can get there. But if I don't know the ending, then I'm scrambling. So I always knew the ending. You know, originally it was Mary and Lori on the floor of her kitchen and it changed to the attic. But I knew emotionally where I had to get Mayor. And um, so I felt like when I, I, I was able to capture the ending, then I, I just have to get there in a believable way. And, and, you know, listen, I mean, I was constantly rewriting things and there were so many scenes that changed and so many moments, like you were talking about Evan Peters earlier, even before this started. And like, you know, Evan came up with so many amazing lines on the set that day. And I think, you know, one of the things I learned is like, I, if someone has a better idea, I will take it. It was just me writing this. So like, you know, whenever Kate had an idea or Julianne or Jean or Evan, I always would, I would take it because I knew it was a better idea. And, and so I think a part of it is just knowing when you're wrong or knowing when someone has a better idea than you. Um, but I do think, you know, having an ending was hugely important in this case. That's, that's really insightful. Um, okay, this is um, last question. Um, <laughs> I read somewhere um, that Kate Winslet committed to this after reading just your first two scripts. And that, correct me correct me if I'm wrong, um, you hadn't written the rest of the series yet. Is right. that, so yeah, did, you, did you feel a lot of pressure to oh, see yeah. that landing? Yeah, and if so, yeah. how did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, tremendous amount of pressure. I was like, you know, a wreck. Um, I think I dealt like, you know, how do you go on? I think you just go on. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I, I just had to go on at that point. Now I was, I mean, at that point, the pressure was on. It was like, okay, you have Kate, you have to write it. I, you know, I couldn't back out at that point. So, um, I, you know, but again, I, I, I will say, and you know, that, that when I got to the idea of Ryan, I felt pretty confident that in terms of the emotion the show would need, it would land. And, and that's like, I'm a big emotion guy. That's sort of how I write things. And and it's the things I watch, the things I'm interested in is just anything that's really emotional. Um, and so I was pretty confident that I could get the ending in a, a, a really emotional place. Um, and so I just kind of, so that was my anchor and I just went with it and like, um, but again, I, you know, just being open to other people's ideas. I mean, so many people gave me great ideas. I got to, I got to say, I wrote all the episodes, but so many of these lines were Evans or Kate's or Julianne's. And like, I could give you a million examples where someone had a better line than Brad Inglesby and it, it, it worked way better than anything I wrote. I promise you that. <laughs> well, and it definitely just, just so we can dive into the script, just really, really quick before we, before we wrap here. Um, uh, Kat, if you could just go to, um, where is it? Oh, it's right here. It's right here where Helen says, that's that's my great hope for you, Mayor. And I don't know if anybody caught this, but in um, in the clip, she, she says Marianne. Um, mm -hmm. And I just felt that that, it was like, oh man, like that exactly. makes it. 
no, that's so much better. That's where Jean yeah. makes the great moment. Like, and that's when you just go, I'll take it, I'll sit down because that's a time when she would use her real name. It makes yeah. total sense, you know? And that's where you defer to a great actor like Jean who knows that, you know, as a mother in that moment, I would use Marianne. And, and there were so many times that that happened in the show where I was so glad that I had such strong actresses there who could say, you know, as a mother, I wouldn't say that as, as a sister, I would say, and, I, and it was such a great joy and help to have people that could stand up and say, you know what, I wouldn't say that, Brad. I wouldn't say it to my daughter or my mom. I would say this and we'd go, all right, let's change it. And um, so that's, a, you know, a, I was, I'm incredibly happy I got to work with those women who would correct me when I was, you know, not saying something the right way. Awesome. Uh all right. Well, uh, you know, it is now 5.32. Um, I just want to give the biggest thanks in the world um, to Jack and Chuck and Peter and Laura and Brad. Thank you so, so, so much for your time. I literally could keep going for another hour and a half, but I know that people have things to do. Um, and I just want to say, you know, congratulations on your Emmy nominations. I mean, it's so exciting. And, you know, just thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so yeah, thank much. Thank you for Lauren. having us. It was Appreciate great. it. Thank Lauren. you, Writers Guild. Thank you. Yes.